Good afternoon, everybody, and a big welcome to Cartesian Talks. Uh, my name is Carl Nalter, and it's a great privilege to welcome you to our webinar this afternoon, uh, the first of a regular series that uh, Anthea Gardner, MD of Cartesian Capital, is going to be hosting. And she's doing that because with all her clever research, she's going to tell us how to make lots of money and make the best of uh, the situation we find ourselves in. Anthea, as I think we all know, is a well-known uh, asset manager within South Africa. And uh, in her network, she's got some interesting people. And today she's invited Nick Hudson, uh, who uh, I don't think likes necessarily being described as an actuary, but is a brilliant actuary. Uh, but he's on as part of his uh, role as a coordinator for pandemic, pandemic data and analytics, Panda. And these guys made some headlines at the start of COVID, arguing that lockdown may in fact do more harm. So without any further ado, we're going to have a presentation from Anthea. Uh, we're going to have a presentation from Nick today. We're going to have lots of time for questions. But before we get going, I'm going to hand over to you, Anthea, and just if you could tell our uh, guests, what is the purpose of this webinar, apart from helping us make lots of money? Good afternoon, Carol. Thank you very much and welcome to everybody. Um, so the reason we're doing these webinars, I think, is because we all know that the stock market is dynamic and literally changes every second of the trading day. Um, and a lot of that is noise and can be ignored. But there are also companies reporting every day. And as much as I'm trying to make sense of where the economy and the markets are going, I'd like my clients to take comfort in the facts and figures rather than just the emotive arguments or discussions that are out there. So I'm planning um, for there to be lots of market updates, um, such as how the coronavirus or the US riots will be impacting the stock markets and your portfolios. And then also I'll cover a couple of critical topics such as pension funds, uh, personal risk, different asset classes. And I think people do have lots of questions. So I'd like to take these opportunities to answer some of those questions on the webinars. Um, and then hopefully for the people in the industry, perhaps we could even get these videos accredited for CPD points. Great, thanks Anthea. We're definitely gonna have these uh, webinars accredited. Um, and uh, you sometimes make it look so easy when uh, you present, um, but I know that a lot of work goes into it. So uh, we look forward to the update that you're gonna share with us. You're gonna kick us off uh, and then uh, we'll move over to Nick, who is patiently waiting in the wings to bedazzle us with some serious latest facts and figures relating to COVID. But over to you, Anthea. So like everybody in these things, I'm just going to share my screen very quickly. If you'll give me a second. Um, there we go. And I'm just, I'm going to actually just jump straight into it. Um, so You'll remember, or do you remember, I should say, the brand recognition game where they used to take out the name of the company, show you the logo, and see if you could still recognize the brand. Not to worry if you don't. This is slightly different. I've left in the names of the brands. Um, see how many you recognize? Um, because every single one of these companies has filed for business rescue or chapter 11 bankruptcy since the corona crisis. And this is only a very small subset of the bigger picture. Now I imagine every landlord that has lost a tenant and actually probably the more worrying fact about this is how many employees companies have had to lay off. So I spent an inordinate amount of time on the weekend seeing if I could figure out how many people each of these companies employs. Um, don't worry, I still had wine to get me through it because the one thing I learned during the lockdown was how good it is to make friends who are influential people. I didn't quite get to what I thought was a good enough answer, but have a look at the next video. It's the weekly jobless claims number in the United States of America. It starts in 1965 and every tick, and it goes quite quickly, so you need to pay a bit of attention. Every tick is the number of people in the US applying for unemployment benefits in, in one week. So let me show you this, this very quickly. So watch carefully. You'll see that there are a couple of spikes in every decade, but the average hangs around the 300,000 to 400,000 levels until we get to 2020. Now let's see what happens in the stock market. 
oh, sorry, these are the unemployment numbers, not the stock market just yet. It's just bizarre, right? It goes from 281,000 for the week of the 19th of March to 3.3 million people the following week. And that wasn't just a blip because after that, there were 6.6 .6 million people who had lost their jobs. And the week after that, another 6.6 .6 million people. So today, the total number of people in the US alone, just the US, um, who have claimed unemployment benefits in the last 10 weeks, that's not even two months, is over 40 million people. This is a graph of the benchmark S&P 500 index in the US. And while we've seen all these companies file for bankruptcy and 40 million people lose their jobs, use the red line as the first week of the massive job losses. You can see that the stock market preempts the mess and then starts plummeting before the first week of March when we saw all those jobless claims come through. But then it has a solid bounce back to November 2019 levels, either predicting a recovery or just that as countries come out of lockdown, I'm guessing investors are thinking that things are going to be or not going to be as bad as investors initially thought. Let's talk about South Africa for a bit. Because we've seen exactly the same thing happen on the JSE. This is the all share index. And again, that red line is the first week of March. We haven't quite got back to the levels of November last year. We need to go back a bit further in history but you can clearly see that the market has already bounced. Um, and more than anything, I think this is pointing to a huge disconnect between what's happening on the stock market and what's happening on the ground. So even though we've seen a bounce in the stock market, I think lockdown has brought economic pain that is predicted to last years longer than the actual weeks and months that we were quarantined. According to the SARS commissioner, and he should know, South Africa lost 15 billion rand in taxes due to the cigarette and alcohol ban. And then of course, on top of that, up to the end of last week, 6.5 million South Africans have applied for the COVID-19 special grant of which SASA has managed to pay a mere 117,000. In addition, UIF has paid 15.8 million rand to 3 million employees at 200,000 companies. I mean, I'm not kidding when I say we need those taxes, right? And then, of course, we mustn't forget that even with the 20% decline in revenue collection, which Edward Kiesvetter was happy to remind us, SARS will still collect over 1.1 trillion rand this year. Um, and then it is predicted that the South African economy will shrink by anything between 7 and 15% this year. I believe there's a very good chance that we could join the ranks of countries like Syria and Burkina Faso with an unemployment rate of over 50%. Our debt to GDP, which is currently around 62%, is likely to hit 80%, which by the way, in my mind, puts us very much in the IMF bailout territory. And then while the, pre the president probably has the right idea when he says it's time to move from a relief economy to a recovery economy, there's no doubt we need to kickstart this economy, right? But I'm intrigued by this idea of the new economy. The sectors that, that, that have performed worse during lockdown include tourism, retail, private security, food and beverages, which is very much kind of your traditional sectors, right? The sectors that have done well during the crisis, uh, the companies that produce sanitizing products, PPE, e-commerce has done well, delivery services, apps, cloud computing, social media, you know, the, those kind of online um, companies or online businesses. I, I, while I'm on the subject, I must actually mention, I see that Tencent, which is partly owned by NASPES, our very own NASPES, or National of Hess, as they used to be called, released a new game this morning and servers around the globe actually crashed as players downloaded this new game called, and I'm not sure how to pronounce this properly, Valorant, I think is how it's, how it's pronounced, but great for NASPERS, right? I mean, when I last checked, it was up about one and a half percent on the day. But you know, the JSC is not actually made up of just NASPERS, although it is a big weight in the index. 
And there are very many companies that don't fit so nicely into this new economy. ABSA the other day said that they're looking for bad debts to have doubled. Standard Bank have warned that bad loan write-offs may exceed 2008 crisis. PEPCO, that all these very traditional businesses, PEPCO is estimating that lost revenue from the lockdown is in the region of 476 million rand. Woolworths reported the other day, they saw sales in their food department grow by 17% in March and April, which quite frankly is an outstanding number. But in their fashion, beauty and home division, sales declined by 95% in April. And of course they did, right? Because we, didn't, we couldn't get access to um, the fashion or home or beauty divisions within the Woolworths. So I think what I've done really is point out how bad things are in the economy right now, but now what, right? And I must admit, I've been very reticent to criticize the government for implementing lockdown. I, I honestly don't think there is a playbook or a perfect answer. And there's another thing. I have family in Cape Town and the last thing I want to do is risk exposing the grandparents to this virus. Um, so, so I'm kind of torn between, we really need to get this economy kick-started and oh my goodness, look at these coronavirus numbers. They are just absolutely horrific. And I think actually now is exactly the perfect time to um, hand over to Nick, because I think his research will give us some nice insights into the coronavirus infection rates. Great, thank you very much, Anthea. Um, I'm just going to start my video here and go like so. Thanks, Anthea. Now that you've um, totally depressed us, the fact that everything has, uh, has gone to the dogs, I'm hoping that Nick is going to give us some good news. Um, so Nick, over to you. Um, I'm not going to spend lots of time introducing you, as I said, a brilliant actuary, um, but far more interested in your some might say controversial views um, around the lockdown and the impact that's had on the economy. So big welcome to you, Nick. Uh, thanks very much, Carl and Anthea. It's great to be on a webinar with a former schoolmate and a former colleague. I just need a granny in the room to make me feel really at home. Um, you guys are scraping the barrel though, if you're turning over to an actuary to talk about mortality in order to give you the good news. Huh? <laughs> We're hoping you're going to make it interesting. Okay, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Um, yeah, I didn't disagree with too much that Anthea had to say there, I must say. Uh, the economic story is uh, looking very, very ugly, and it's not just in South Africa. Um, I'm not good with slides. In fact, in, in boardrooms, I tend to ban them. I don't allow PowerPoint anywhere in their boardrooms, but I've got two slides. because I'm a good boy, and I was asked to put two together. Um, so I'm going to share screen quickly and, uh, let's see, there we go. Um, but before I turn the first page, I want to put a couple of my biases on the table. Um, the first one is I'm a bit of a numbers and facts guy. And so if that's a little bit, uh, spooky for everybody, I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, the second one is I deal in the scientific domain of conjecture and criticism. So I don't uh, take arguments from authority, from anybody. Any theory, any explanation of the world is fair game for criticism. And if you've got those two things straight about me, then uh, we should have an easier time as I go into discussing these, uh, as you say, controversial concepts. Um, a little bit of background quickly on Panda. We don't have any affiliation with any um, political or uh, corporate entities. We are simply a bunch of concerned citizens who saw a major problem coming, um, saw a panic pandemic and predicted a very dangerous set of circumstances, not just for South Africa, but for the world. Um, and we started informally, just exchanging ideas and being worried together, I guess. And then um, when the lockdown arose and we started seeing the scope for a trap in permanent lockdown effectively, uh, we started marshalling our um, efforts more in a more concerted kind of way. 
I'm not going to hold back in this presentation. In previous ones, we've kind of been a little bit tentative, a little bit mousy, a little bit scared, actually, of saying things that were controversial in an environment full of emotion and full of stress. We do understand that people are fearful. In fact, we think it's one of the big problems at the moment that has to be dealt with. Um, but I am going to not hold back. I'm going to discuss seven coronavirus myths. I'm going to rattle them off quickly and hopefully we will, I doubt we'll have time to discuss all seven, but some of them should be interesting conversations. So the first one is the myth that the lockdown was a question of trading lives for money or not locking down was a question of trading lives for money. We wrote a paper um, at the beginning of our efforts called quantifying years of lost life to lockdown. And in that paper, we showed how our economic contraction has a mortality impact uh, all of its own. And we tried really hard to make lockdown look better than the, in, in terms of the coronavirus impact than the economic contractions impact, and we failed. What we found in that paper was that the consequences of the lockdown were some 30 times worse than the consequences or the, than the benefits of the lockdown, the potential benefits of the lockdown. And that was kind of a conservative estimate and was the paper that got everybody's attention and enabled us to start talking about you know, this thing in a more balanced way uh, with the trade-offs in mind. The second one, uh, the second myth is that the virus itself is significant on a global level. Um, at the moment, if you took the, where the world is heading to, we probably will end up with half a million people having died. And whilst every single death is a tragedy, we need to see that in the context of a planet of 7.8 billion people um, where some, I think the, 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 the number is something in the region of 50 million people die every year. Um, so a hundred times the level that uh, is involved in coronavirus. And in fact, if you took all the lost life from the coronavirus with those half a million deaths and spread them over the general population, you'd end up reducing everybody's lifespan by four hours. Not years, not days, hours. And that's a stat that tends to shock people when we say it, but it does put it into perspective what we are dealing with here and how something that started off as being a huge threat has dwindled to a much smaller one and yet occupies our minds in the way that a very big threat would. The third myth is the myth that lockdowns have flattened the curve. I will not take you through the boring statistics. I'm going to make the claims and show you one or two slides, but that is a myth. There has been no flattening of the curve and we can support that assertion by reference to the vast trove of international information that is now available about this disease. There are 80 countries who have peaked and whose epidemics are in decline. And when you compare the timing of their peaks, how long it takes to get from first death to the peak death, and you compare that to the stringency of the lockdown or the actual impact of the lockdown in terms of social mobility, as measured by uh, tele telephonic mobility, you find that there's no relationship between these two things. And that's strange. We have, we have ideas about why that might be the case, but I'm just stating it to you as a bold fact right now. We can engage in it later if, if that's of interest to everybody. The fourth one is a, one that I, I actually find, it's quite staggering that I even have to write it down. But what we have found is that there are many people who believe that the lockdowns didn't really come with an uh, incremental economic cost, that all the cost lay in the virus itself and the panic response to the virus. But th this is a very um, misguided perspective. Um, the lockdowns incremental to what was going on with the virus have resulted in deep, deep economic declines. And that is manifest all over the world in a variety of ways. Um, there are strange people out there who forecast equal declines for countries that were locked down to ones that weren't. But those are just their forecasts. When you look at the actual facts, the emerging economic data, lockdown countries are faring far worse than non-lockdown countries or likely lockdown countries. The fifth myth is the one that uh, the World Health Organization is largely responsible for, for creating, which is the myth that developing countries, poorer countries, are at greater risk than developed countries. And that couldn't be further from the truth. When you look at the international experience, and that includes a great many developing countries that have gone past their peaks and are now in the declining phases of their epidemics, what emerges is that developing countries have 
far lighter experience than developed countries. And it's by a very material amount. So the first one that we saw was Iran. And since then, there have been many, uh, including Mexico, Russia, that um, have just exhibited massively lighter experience than uh, developed countries. This is even true within continents. So for example, Eastern Europe, which is less developed than Western Europe, has had a much lighter epidemic experience. The sixth myth is that South Africa faces unique risks. This was a totally legitimate concern to have. We have um, some severe disease burden in our population, particularly in the form of tuberculosis and HIV. And we were very worried about this when we started monitoring what was going on in the country. We wanted to think about ways in which it, we could assess whether those risks are actually material and whether they present unusual threats to South Africa. But what we have found is that the little tests that we set up have all pointed to South Africa's epidemic behaving in a very similar fashion to those that have been seen elsewhere in the world. And then the seventh risk, the, the seventh myth that, we, that I wanted to mention is this idea that the virus is a threat to a great many people. With every more detailed analysis of the actual uh, deaths that have occurred in countries that keep good records, the picture that emerges is very clear that this disease overwhelmingly strikes very old or very sick people. Um, something less, something materially less than 1% of the population of any given country um, is, is really at anything other than a negligible risk of death to, from the virus. And, um, you know, the numbers in, in this regard are, are, are very strong and are experienced in Denmark, in Italy, in Hungary, in New York, wherever you look. Um, so those are the seven myths. And that's an awful lot of myth busting to do on one slide. And um, hence the need for me to but, um, convey my biases before I even got going. Um, I realize that some of these get stuck in people's throats, but this is a, there's, no, there's no time to wait until everybody's settled down before we address these. Um, they're important because a failure to appreciate these myths is causing a great deal of harm and a great deal of misery and death that will, by orders of magnitude, exceed the misery that comes from the virus itself. So that's my one slide. Second slide, quickly. Um, it's important to understand where we've come from and where we've gotten to. When the first big model that caused the big fright in South Africa came out, so came a, um, had a best case model in terms of which 10% of the population becoming infected, which is 5.8 million people, um, would be this little blue curve on the right. Um, Sorry, is this, I need to get this thing out the way. Can I shut it down? There we go. This little blue curve on the right. Um, <clears throat> the worst case scenario was this one where 40% of the country became infected and um, resulting in 27 million people infected. Now at the bottom here, we have what's happened, not for South Africa, but for the entire world. Okay. So Sakema's best case scenario involved what has actually turned out to be the whole world's experience. The best case scenario for South Africa, the whole world's experience. Now, since then, all the models have been revised downwards and we are trying very hard to let some more reality prevail, let some more common sense prevail and to see those models reduced further because we believe they are very causal in us entering lockdowns all over the world and staying in them. Um, and they're also causal of us allocating resources in a very bad way. Uh, we are focusing on a disease which is far down the list of uh, South Africa's concerns with 643 deaths right now. And I realize we're still in the early phases of our epidemic, but it's worthwhile just putting it in context. That puts coronavirus just between drowning as a cause of death and protein energy malnutrition. Now it will go up. It will go up a little bit but we have to see it in the context of the annual 56,000 deaths that come from HIV and the 8,000 deaths that come from tuberculosis. Now, because of the allocation of resources away from those diseases and towards this small thing that's causing potentially a, 
600, you know, 600 deaths so far and uh, potentially a few, uh, several thousand more. But because of this diversion of resources, we expect to see huge deterioration in the death experience from HIV and tuberculosis over the coming months. It's not going to take long. And that, for us, constitutes a specific type of madness. We have lost our senses and we are causing a great deal of harm with our policies. So that is my introduction. Um, I'm going to stop sharing screen for now unless something comes up later that how do I stop this, the screen share guys. Um, there we go. Perfect. Um, Thanks, Nick. Can we launch straight into questions or are you wanting to wrap up? No, I, I'm, I'm good to launch straight into questions. I've said a lot. Um, the, um, have I stopped sharing screens? Is that? Yep. yep. No, you're good. So okay, I'm sorry. going to launch straight into questions for, for both you and Anthea. Um, yep. And um, I'm going to kick off with you and, and look at that last slide that you shared. There's comments that if we hadn't had a hard lockdown, then that would have been far greater. And so the analogy might be, if we don't wear uh, condoms, there'll be more cases of HIV. If we don't exercise more, we'll have more heart attacks. Yeah. What's your view on that? So I think the main reason people have this perception is because they anchor at the beginning of the process in the models that are forecasting these tens of thousands of deaths or, hundred, or hundreds of thousands, in fact, at the beginning. And there's this idea, I think, that fixes in people's minds that because we have, we're not seeing those models deaths, that that's because of the lockdown, okay? But as I said, when we look at the international uh, experience, there's no um, correlation between these, um, these events. So lockdowns overseas have not resulted in curves being flattened or extinguished. They simply, we simply see the same pattern of a rapid increase in cases, a rapid increase in deaths, and then a, a disappearing of the, of the death rate over quite a short period of time. Um, and this is one of the very hard things for people to swallow, that we've been through all of this for potentially no benefit. Um, and I do realize, I do really realize that that is an enormously bitter tablet to swallow. But it's hard to argue against the facts. Um, and it's not just one analysis. You know, I mentioned if you measure the, the, the time from the first death to the peak and compare it to last lockdown stringency, that there's no relationship. That's just one of seven different analyses. If you look at the decay rate of the, what's called the reproduction rate of the epidemic, the rate at which cases grow. Now, the, the, the interesting thing about this epidemic is it has a decay rate. It doesn't grow exponentially. It grows what's called sub-exponentially. That decay rate is unaffected all over the world by the introduction of lockdowns or the lifting of lockdowns. And, and the best proof of that at the moment is the very models that were used to project these uh, very high deaths and you know, the models all saying that if you lock down, the death, deaths will be lower. Those same models are telling everybody, well, don't lift your lockdown because the deaths are gonna come racing back. And we look all around the world and not one instance of resurgence as it's called, not one. The death, has, the death chart, the path of this, in this epidemic has been unaffected by the implementation and the lifting of lockdowns. The modelers are surprised. They should be honest that they're surprised and it should be causing them to reassess their models because those models were wrong. Those models caused the panic, which has been immensely costly. Thanks, Nick. So I want to ask both you and Anthea a question using... Um, if we accept your analysis um, and with the controversy around schools opening or not, as the case might be, um, interested in your views around education schools um, and some of the work that you guys have done linked to that. And then we're going to ask Anthea to tell us uh, if there are some education linked shares, equities, is this a sector we should be investing in or running for the hills? Yeah, I've got kids of my own and this, this one is very close to my heart. I, I find it just terrible that our kids are locked indoors and trying to battle along with uh, online education. Um, 
you know, this is, we don't have to, we don't have to make forecasts about what will happen in South Africa if all our children go back to school. We can just look at the countries that never took their children out of school. Um, there are a couple of important points. First of all, the risks to children are beneath negligible. You know, the, the number of um, actual deaths associated with coronavirus is very low. Coronavirus is very low in children, and it's largely associated with some extremely tragic cases of kids with late stage cancers or very premature babies, that kind of thing. Children are simply not at risk here. They don't, they also are not big transmitters. If they are transmitters at all, there's some contention around that, but there's not a lot of risk to the parents or to the teachers from children who may be infected. Um, and so it's a, it, it's a great sadness for me that we are looking at a, a whole half year almost of uh, classes being suspended, uh, children um, suffering, I, I believe, real psychological damage from not being able to associate freely with their, um, their friends and their, in their normal environment. Um, and I, I actually think this is one of the ways in which the, the poorest are hardest hit. Um, you know, where we, we have uh, the ability to do webinars and, and put our kids on computer screens and pay attention to their well-being in a way that I think most people don't have. And uh, so it's easy to sit in suburbia and say, oh, I'm keeping my kids out of school, which is a, a comment we've heard many times, much to our surprise. Um, and then impose the same thing on kids who are living in much more straightened circumstances. So, you know, our view would be, you know, they should never have been taken out of school. We should send them back to school. All this fuss about chlor chlorinated tents and um, PPE for the schools and so on is very overblown. Um, and there's, not, there's no threat. We should send them back. Thanks. Anthea, education sector, what do you see us doing with our investments? So before I even get to that, I have to say or, or highlight that this really has focused our attention on the haves and have nots, right? So in South Africa, because we're such a deeply divided society, um, the, the issues are more than just should they, shouldn't they go back. And then there's also the question, and Nick points out to the fact that there are very few infections and deaths in the younger generations or, or the youth or whatever you want to call them. In fact, I believe Nick thinks that anything under 75, you're relatively safe. <laughs> and we'll get back to Nick about that. So thanks for that. Um, but I, I, I do find the real humanitarian issue raises its head for me here because I have family in Cape Town and I have nieces and nephews, and if they go back to school and infect their grandparents, I don't know if I would be comfortable making that call. Like, and so that's the part of this, this kind of lockdown that really worries me. I'll stop going off on a tangent now, Carl, um, is that we, we always seem to have a ones and zeros approach to everything. Should we have lockdown or shouldn't we have lockdown? I, I feel like we're missing the in between stage, you know, like surely there is a better way of doing things. Um, and I'm not talking about this new economy stuff that doesn't apply to South Africa. I'm really just talking about an education system that works um, and a lockdown or some form of lockdown that works now, which shares in the um, education sector on the JSC. And really, there are two, aren't there? There's Curo and Advitech. And Advitech put out a trading statement, I think it was last week or the week before, and in fact said, that they've seen a 20% increase in late payments. So they have put forward 24 million rand or have had to put 24 million rand in the kitty to support parents who have either lost their jobs, taken pay cuts, their companies aren't revenue, uh, generating revenue. Um, and of course the share got hit quite badly for it. So if you're asking me, absolutely, is there a stock pick then? Yes, Curo, I would say go and buy some of those shares because I think there are lots of companies on the JSC where um, they've been harder hit than they probably should have. So they are really just sitting there very cheaply. Will they bounce back immediately? Will Curo, you know, will parents suddenly jump, come to the party and pay that 24 million rand in support that Curo has put forward? Probably not. So, you know, I, I can't say that you'll make your money back immediately or make huge amounts of profits, but I'd say it's cheap enough to be buying some curios right now. And if there's some of those others that you showed us, like a com do you think they're going to come out of a business rescue? I mean, is that some I of do. these companies? Yeah, so. I, I do. I do actually think. So the share is now being suspended at one rand per share. 
And I'm not um, pointing fingers and I'm not saying Kame is doing this, but I am pointing to the fact that some companies are using this crisis to restructure and to say, well, actually we had no cash flow, we have to get rid of some staff, you know, we have to look at downsizing. And actually, if we stay the way we are now, we just can't afford to operate. Um, I, I, you know, it, it amazed me when Kame went into business rescue. It was voluntary, by the way, because it's a company that for the first time last year in its 20 odd years of operation had made a loss. First time, first year it had made a loss. Very good management, very strong balance sheet, and yet decided to um, go into business rescue and suspend their shares. So you can't actually buy any right now, Carl, sorry, but maybe yeah, watch out for when they come back. So Nick, back to you. We've got a couple of questions uh, that I want to direct to you. The first one is, when do you see uh, corona cases in South Africa peaking? So in terms of deaths, when does yeah. that happen? I just, want to, I just wanted to correct one thing. Um, it, I think uh, Anthea mentioned that I thought there was low risk for anybody below 75. That's not true. I, I believe that for any healthy person without comor comorbidities below 75, this is a low risk story. Uh, that's important to understand. The, the presence of the classic vascular comorbidities that have been chronic in a person, so not something they uh, procured yesterday, if they've had 20 years of um, diabetes or hypertension, then th th those become issues for anybody, um, but in particular for older people. So I just wanted to set that straight. Um, so the question, Carl, was when do we see the peak and what is the kind of forecast for total deaths? Yeah, yeah we think that there's no reason to believe that South Africa will behave differently from the rest of the world. The peak would be sometime this month and um, toward, probably towards the end of the month. And uh, that we also find it difficult to believe that there would be more than 10,000 deaths. We have stayed away from building very complicated models. Uh, we think that's been part of the problem here. Models, models tend to overcomplicate. They, they use structures that then um, become the challenge for the modeler. And they spend too much time with their heads in the model and not enough time looking up to see what the real world is telling them. And to cal recalibrate those models to the real world, that's a big problem here. Nick, there's a question which I think we can guess at your answer, but uh, they position it saying maybe it is an unfair question, but if you had to rate uh, on one to 10, the approach taken by the South African government um, in terms of sincerity, empathy, sympathy, et cetera, where would you rate them? It's a difficult one because I don't think there are many examples of governments that have been high on, on, on sincerity and empathy all around the world. Uh, there are very few. Um, I think there has been, uh, I, it, I need to be critical here. I think there's been a very nasty securocrat element to all of this. Um, there's been incredible irrationality. I mean, the, the height of it all right now, we, we worry about two things. We have big concerns about two things. The one is what is being done to protect the elderly in nursing homes, because it's the nursing home elderly who have such bad experience elsewhere in the world. People who live, live in family settings, old people who live in family settings, have much less risk than people who are living in nursing homes. And with all the attention given to walking dogs and surfers and uh, uh, testing and contact tracing and PPE and distancing and who's allowed to do what at what time and whether you sell hot pies, all of that stuff is detracting from our ability to address the real thing that I fear, which is that this virus gets stuck into nursing homes, because when it does, it's tragic. I mean, uh, the, the Cuomo uh, in New York, you know, that's the distinguishing feature of the New York epidemic. The reason for it being bad is he forced nursing homes to accept coronavirus patients, anticipating a major overburdening of the New York health system because of the crazy models he was looking at. He basically conducted bio warfare against nursing homes. And I'm worried that we are we at the point right now, I'm telling you the peaks in a few weeks time, and I'm not seeing the sense of urgency and the, 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 the kind of quality of ideas that I think we need. We've been given this warning system of what else happens in the rest of the world. Look at the threat. It's the one thing that the Swedes have admitted that they've handled badly was the nursing home crisis. And I just got off the phone yesterday talking to a Canadian doctor who was saying that they had 85% of the Canadian deaths have occurred in nursing homes 
the management of the situation was so bad, they called in the army to take over the management. And that's Canada with an amazing healthcare system, you know, and a very wealthy country with a, a huge social uh, network, a social um, safety net and so on. Um, they ended up at 85%. We should be learning from that not imitating the bad features of lockdown. We should be looking at that experience and saying, what can we do? We should be looking at, can we depopulate those nursing homes? Can we take them into younger families' homes, uh, older people to avoid this intense burdening um, that comes with multiple cases in a small area? That's when this thing gets dangerous. Um, so I, I, I kind of have to look at this and say, no, this whole secure craft kind of approach has actually caused us to fail to address the things that are addressable. Um, and so a low score, Carl, a low score, um, cool. I'm afraid. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. Anthea, back to you in terms of, and you touched on this in the beginning of your presentation. Um, so we had a major drop of markets at the beginning of, of lockdown. We then had a bounce back. Uh, what ne next? If we're assuming that Nick's right, does that mean at the end of this month, we're going to see an upsurge again as business gets back on track or what? It's very difficult to say what is going to happen in the stock market. Um, what we do know is that the market prices forward, you, you know, so if investors are positive and they think things are going to go well, well, then it will bounce. And if they don't, it'll go badly. I think the, and, and so I always talk about this disconnect between the stock market and the real economy. And I think for me, the real economy is the concern at the moment, not so much the stock market. You know, I've got slides and slides that show how the stock market always bounces back. And if you're a smart investor, you're in it for the long term because you understand being in the stock market for the long term will earn you the appropriate um, rewards for the risk you're taking. Cyril Ramaphosa last week actually admitted that he was handed a weak economy. And so there are so many predictions about, we don't know, of course, but the predictions are that this economy will shrink or contract anything between 7 and 15% or whatever it is. And I think for the next five years, we're really looking at, at struggling to get the economy back. I mean, it, it's very kind of logical. We've got companies in South Africa that are filing for business rescue, that are closing down, that are laying off people. These are the same companies that I think it'll take very long before they start up again, before we get to the same level of demand that we had pre-COVID-19. Um, and so predictions are that there will be four to six million people losing their jobs in the South African economy in the next year, or kind of, I guess in the next six months even. And to get those people employed again is, is just going to be a long, hard struggle. And in fact, one of the things that our president did say last week was that we need to become a little bit um, Trump-esque, I guess, and you know, make South Africa great again and start buying local, um, focus on the agriculture, focus on basically, he said, I think feeding ourselves, really. Um, and so, so the stock market will be what it will be. You know, it'll be volatile as it always is. I, I think the focus now has to be on rebuilding an economy that, that we've really ruined in the last two or three months, more so than before. Thanks very much. We've got a couple of questions around um, government, Nick, and whether Panda has been engaging with government. Has government got an appetite to listen to you? Do they realize, um, would they follow your logic and agree with it, and we would see lockdown ending sooner um, or not? It's difficult always to link cause and effect in complicated situations like this. We participated in the modeling symposium organized a couple of weeks ago by uh, Minister Nkise, and we were positioned in that uh, agenda straight after the modelers, and we gave them a good, hard uh, talking to, pointing out what we thought were the major mistakes in the modeling. Uh, we do think the modeling here has been very much a part, of, a, a cause of the tragedy here. I go as far without any reservation. Uh, to, as to say that the modelers here have blood on their hands. Uh, they were behaving like they're playing a game of model, model, you know, not looking up at the real world. And the consequences of that game have been devastating and uh, will continue to be devastating for some time still to come. Um, so we, we have had uh, interaction there at the, at, in that symposium. And then um, there's, we've also um, had uh, 
uh, some interaction at lower levels of government and uh, um, engagement through people around the presidency, but at a fairly light level. It's been a bit disappointing. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Anthea, you've not heard any hard questions, and so I want to go to Leleto's question. Um, and now that you've had lots of background in your own research, Leleto asks, given the current performance of equity asset class since the lockdown, would it be safe to seem there is a break in the relationship between the economic fundamentals, financial markets, um, given the risk of recession? And which investments would be suitable in terms of ESG and, and SDG? So if I can paraphrase that and just make it a bit simpler, in my own mind, it is, is the economy, because it's so artificial because of the lockdown, still having a direct impact on the markets? Or is that so skewed from what it was in the past? Mm, that is a very good question. So, you know, if in 2008, you had a, like thrown a dart at any company listed in 2008 on the JSC, coming out of the global financial crisis, you would have made money. Now I think things are very different. Um, you know, you've got the Comers, the Edcons that have gone bust, um, uh, Pumalela Gaming that has gone into business rescue. There's so many that are actually just not going to be around next year. So it is very difficult. Um, and then on the other side of it, you've got the MTNs or the bid corps that have actually not, that have kind of held their own throughout or managed to stay afloat. And as we come out of lockdown and demand is reignited, that these companies are bound to recover and to rebound. Um, has the fundamental analysis broke down? No, I, I actually don't think so. I think you've got to really just be careful about which shares you buy and where you're going. It's very difficult to give very kind of generic investment advice, but the the, the best I can do with this is really to say, look for companies with strong balance sheets, the ones that will survive, and where there will still be demand at the end of it. I don't, I don't think the relationship is broken down. I think we've always had this great disconnect between the stock market and the real economy. Um, and, and so just watch carefully where you're going. Yeah, and I think just to extend on that, and I think that's why it's important to, to emphasize the kind of analysis that you do, the kind of asset manager that you and Cartesian are, you engage with people like Nick, whether you agree with everything or some or none of what they say, but that's what you do to come at recommendations for what to buy, what to hold. It's not sort of just crystal ball gazing. There's, there's fact behind it. Oh, absolutely. Yes. So, so the, the entire day, that's all we do. We look at balance sheets of companies. We look at the fundamentals. We look at demand from around the globe. We see where, you know, what other investors are doing and kind of decide where you want to be. And, and so investing is not as clear cut as, oh, which share should I buy that will double? You know, it's how old are you? What are you saving or investing for? Where do you want to be placed in the market? And so the discussion really is about your personal risk. And that might be our next webinar. It's about who you are and what suits you, which investment suits you. Are you willing to take the risk that an MTN, for example, is going to rebound and maybe double in price? Or maybe it's going to halve. You know, are you the kind of investor that can take that or do you need an income from your investments and therefore you probably want to be in a bond um, fund of sorts. Um, and certainly the bond funds, geez, I, I, I'm intrigued, amazed at how well the bonds have performed in South Africa um, through this time, which has been great. And in fact, even the RAND has come back quite nicely. And so those are all the kinds of things we look at on a daily basis every single day. Um, to come to the conclusions that we do on investments. Thanks. Um, we're going to have about two or three more questions, and I want to ask this of Nick and you. Um, this is potentially probably um, not the last pandemic we'll experience as a country, as a world. Um, so I'm interested to hear from you, Nick, your thoughts on that. Do you think we are likely to see that again in South Africa? Obviously, that will influence how we invest. Um, and yeah, so let me let me leave it there for now, and then I'm going to go to Anthea to pick on, on pick up on that. Yeah, I mean, epidemics have been with humanity forever. Um, we co-evolved with uh, viruses. Viruses predate the the, the, the Cambrian uh, era. You know, they're proterozoic phenomena. Um, we we will have we will have more epidemics. Um, the question we ask is not. How, you know whether that's a problem or whether we 
are going to have more and does that have an impact? Of course they have an impact, but the thing that we have to learn how to deal with is how not to panic, how not to allow our intensely connected world with cameras and mobile phones and social media everywhere turning us into gibbering wrecks every time there's a threat on the horizon. You know, this has been an extraordinary misread of risk and has caused a, great, a much greater catastrophe than the virus ever could have. And we have to start asking the question of how do we protect ourselves? How do we give ourselves the, the courage, the, the clear headedness to see things for what they are and to avoid this kind of panic again? Um, it could come around next year, you know, we could have another, a, a bad flu or uh, something like that. And we have to start asking this question, how do we organize the world to avoid this kind of very centrally driven story? I mean, mm. I, I'd like to turn that question around, actually, Carl, if I may. Um, I think, I, I actually am quite optimistic. I think we, we've, we've going to learn a whole lot of lessons about what was wrong with the way we organized the world, not just here in South Africa, but all over. Yeah. I think some of the problems are to do with the incredible degree of centralization we have. You know, the World Health Organization made mistake after mistake after mistake, and there was no method of error correction. You know, that's what comes when, when you have big centralized bodies telling everybody what to do. And the same is true for governance. I mean, one of the best things I think that happened to the United States was that Trump's reaction was such a disastrous failure and such an incompetent mess, you know? It actually was a blessing in disguise because it meant that 50 states could get on and do, do their own thing and, and they chose different paths. And what that enables us to do is to look afterwards and see how much difference there was between those different paths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll tell you now for free, the United States' experience has been much better than Europe's. And that's, a, that's, a, that's something that surprises everybody. Uh, there, there are lots of reasons for that, so I don't attribute it all to policy. Yeah. But I, I'm actually very positive. I'm very hopeful. I think we can engage around some of these questions now as a world, as a country, as, as citizens. We can look at these things and ask questions. Do we want our world to be organized that way? Isn't there a better way of doing this? I'm very positive about that. Great. Thank you. So, Anthea, based on, on Nick's optimism um, and the, the last week's financial mail where... Uh, the head of the JSE was talking a little bit about the job that the JSE has and Gillette Tlevi, the journalist, was exploring um, small caps. Small caps is not really something that most asset managers would, would, would focus on. Um, and based on your earlier view around investor appetite being different, do you think that maybe this new world, new economy, might be an opportunity for asset managers like you and Cartesian to, to explore some small caps? So, so we're always looking at small caps. You know, we are very nervous of them, though. The problem with small caps is that they 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 gap. So they trade kind of in in kind of very yeah, like you know, one minute your the spread is ten rand, the next minute the spread is a hundred rand. And when crises like this hit, it is the absolute worst thing for a small cap share. When liquidity dries up, your small caps suffer the absolute worst. And so I, I've never actually, without a few small caps in my um, portfolio, just because there are really good ones out there. And again, it's, it's not about this kind of very generic look at the world to say all small caps are going to bounce very hard because they've been, um, they've come off so much. Uh, again, you have to choose the shares that you believe are going to survive, that are going to thrive as demand picks up again. I mean, and, and just, and also just on the timing of the market, you know, you said that potentially we could have another wave of this, another pandemic. I, you know, there's a very boring, you know, we have so many sayings in the market. There's a very boring one that we always use. It's not about timing the market. It's about time in the market. So don't try and predict the next pandemic and the sell-off in the market. Just understand the volatility, understand your personal risk, understand that your personal risk is having to withdraw your money when the market has fallen like this and maybe waiting a little bit or having, giving yourself the luxury to wait a bit until it bounces again if you're going to need that money in the short term. So kind of choose very carefully where you need to be invested personally. Thanks, Anthea. We're going to come back to you for some concluding remarks and, and the last question. But Nick, I want to give you a, a last question, please. And before I do, thank you very much. It, uh, it's, uh, it's very useful to have someone who is um, as erudite and rational as you explaining your views. 
uh, whether we agree with them or not, uh, is, is for me not the point. And I think it's very useful for investors to, to get these, these kind of views. So thank you very much. And then linked to that, the, the final question I have for you that, that, that one of our listeners has asked is, how do we discern between good and bad information and data? And so not too much on the philosophical fake news concept, but just as investors, um, and I suppose your definition of what's good or bad data will differ, but, but just some thoughts for us going forward. How do we do that? I think the, 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 the one heuristic I have, it's, it's an astonishingly difficult question because if you're not an expert in the field, how do you evaluate one expert from another? And, and in, this, in, this, in this instance, we've had the very worst performance is from the people who spend the most time in the fields. If you're listening to an epidemiologist, you're 97% chance that you're listening to a madman. You know, the 3% have been right, have been astonishing and very, very good. But the other 97% have been a disaster and not listening to them was the best strategy to follow. So it's very difficult. I mean, the one heuristic that I would use is if people are on the same side of arguments by virtue of a tribe, you've got to be careful of listening to anything they say about anything, you know, and there is this clustering that happens. Um, and so I would avoid taking my opinions and forming my opinions based on the opinions of people whose arguments are basically tribal. Um, that's, that's, that's one possible heuristic. And then the other one is, is people who make arguments all on one side of the equation. So for example, uh, this is a classic one. We know that there's undercounting and overcounting of deaths. Okay. Clearly that's the case. But if you hear somebody only ever talking about undercounting of deaths, trying to persuade you that the coronavirus is worse than it really is, that is a sign of an ideologically motivated person. And you want to stay away from ideologically motivated people. There are lots of them in this world and they're a mess. You stay away, you know? So those are the only points I can give. It's very difficult. Um, have sensible friends. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> and listen to uh, Cartesian's webinar. Thanks very much, Nick from Panda. It was Indeed. great to hear. Thank you guys very much. Anthea, last word from you. Um, as we go into what the president's calling the new economy, um, what are you doing for the rest of the week? What, <laughs> what does the week hold for Cartesian? Um, wow, yes. I'm not sure what exactly he means by the new economy. You know, for us, or, or what my understanding of the new economy is, kind of, as I was talking about Tencent's gaming release earlier on today and how the share price has jumped, um, it's about food delivery. It's about how we behave, how we shop online. It's all those kinds of things. So I think when he talks about the new economy, he, he potentially is talking very South Africa specific. And so this kind of buy local, focus on local companies, um, try, try and um, diminish this great divide between wealthy and poor in South Africa. And often it is based on color. Um, so, so yeah, you, you know, every day changes. And the great thing about being an analyst and an asset manager is that as the facts change, I get to change my mind. Um, and, and every single day, that's what I do. You, you know, I would be crazy to tell you that I knew exactly what was going to happen and where we were going to be. And so right now I have a couple of shares in the recovery portfolio that I like and that I'm looking at. But if tomorrow something changes, so be it. I will change my mind and change my portfolio. Carl, do I have a one like 30 seconds to share a graph before we go? And so you can do whatever you want as long as it's going to help us make money. But I think that'll be great. So please do. So, so this is the all share index from 1995 to last night, in fact. It's one of my absolute favorite graphs because as Nick points out, like we're very driven by fear and the market has come off so much and we're really struggling to understand what's going to happen next. But if, and we don't have a crystal ball, right? But if history is anything to go by, have a look at all the, the, the kind of big crisis, crises um, that have happened historically and, and look at the market that that's the equity market and so as you can see in the last while South Africa really has underperformed very much or kind of just gone nowhere and then this huge crisis but if you look at all these other 
kind of big crises. And there is, there is deep, believe it or not, as the current crisis we're experiencing. And all I wanted to show was just how the market just continues to bounce and continues to go up. And it really is just a matter of being able to hang in there and understand um, what happens in the stock market and with your investment. So kind of put the fear and the panic aside, not just from coronavirus, but also from your investments. Great. Thank you so much, Anthea. So just to recap, um, please follow Anthea and Cartesian on uh, social media to be updated on our webinar, which is going to be weekly. Um, if you're a retail investor, Anthea has got a number of products uh, on the Easy Equities platform, um, which she actively manages. So check those out. Um, financial advisors, uh, feel free to be in contact with Anthea directly. Um, I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot here, Anthea, but, uh, and you might not be in the market for more business, but uh, I, uh, I would strongly encourage you guys to get hold of Anthea, particularly during this time, have a conversation about your plans. Uh, assets to see where we go. So thanks both Nick and Anthea. It's nice to chat to clever people. Uh, and it's, uh, it's left me also feeling optimistic, Nick and Anthea. So thank you very much on behalf of all the listeners and uh, have a good rest of the week. Thank you. Thank Let's you very much, everybody. Again. Bye.